First Peter chapter number two. We're going to begin in verse number four and read through verse ten. <clears throat> As we read, I want to call your attention to I want to ask the question rather, are you all in? Who is Christ to you? If you're a hundred percent saved, is he your one hundred percent savior? So as we read, I want you to notice that there's no middle ground with God. He's either all the way or it's no way. I want you to notice that. Okay, here we go. Verse number four of chapter number two. To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Sion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded." Unto you, therefore, which believe he is precious, but unto them which be dis disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient. Whereunto also they were appointed, but ye are a chosen generation." a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained, uh, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Let's pray. Father, we love and thank you for all you do. We thank you so much that you give us a just a straight line, a measure to live up to. And we know we can never achieve it perfectly in this life, and I just ask that you would help us to follow you to the best of our ability and to grow and change and become more of what you want us to be every day. Help us to die to ourselves each and every morning. Help us to remember that you want us to live by faith, complete faith. Lord, we Thank you so much for being the author of our salvation. Thank you so much for loving us. Thank you for saving us completely. Help us here tonight. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm constantly burdened, especially for the young people, especially for those who are going to be going to college. You know, one thing that you need to get nailed down, and I think every young person goes through this, who is God? Who is God to you? I think every believer ought to answer that question. If there's something in the Bible that's offensive, why is it offensive? Is it offensive because you see it and you don't want to adjust your life to it? or you just want to live blind. You see, Jesus is a complete Savior, and He is God's complete way to Him. Period. There's no other way. There's no middle ground. There's no halfway. You're either saved or you're lost. You either belong to God or you don't. You either believe this book or you don't. You know, and I, I'm careful in that because there are things that we see in the Bible and it's like, man, I can never do that. There's a difference between unbelief and un inability to attain. And there's also a difference between inability to attain and inability to want to attain, or rather, not wanting to try to attain. It's not... 
always easy to live for God. It's not easy to do the right thing all the time. In these four walls, it's easy to praise God. It's easy to sing. It's easy to say you believe the Bible. It's easy to quote scripture here. It's easy when all of us are together over at Landmark to go walk up to those people because you don't want to let your brother down. It's easy to try to look like a tough guy. You know, Brother Josh and I were talking about that yesterday when we were out witnessing. When we were both lost, we had the same attitude as young men. My buddies are there. I'm going to do it till I, so I can look cool, so I can look tough. I had, we had this Catholic guy. He was being a smart aleck to me. He thought he was going to try to trip me up. You know, I've dealt with men like him before, so I knew what to expect, kind of. I kind of knew what he was going to say. But the, per, the whole point was he was showing off for his buddy. It's easy to show off for our buddies. It's easy. But is Jesus our complete Savior? I mean, really, here. Because Peter likens disobedience to unbelief. To Peter, they're synonyms. The same way that obedience is faith. Peter says, okay, James says it. Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. Only Peter says, you say you believe it? Let me see. Put faith to your feet. Put your feet to faith. Show me. You see, here in verses, verse 4, he says that we come to a living stone. That means Christ is alive. In his, the, the reason the Bible can change lives is because it's a living word. It is alive. It is not a dead book. Do you know why it's not a dead book? Because the author of it is not dead. Amen. He's <laughs> Christ is the living stone that some men will stumble at. He's the stone that will crush some. And He's the stone that can save and give life. But see, Peter says that we're coming to a living stone, disallowed indeed of men. What's he talking about there? What does he mean disallowed of men? He's talking about the religious Jews. You know, and I wonder, I want to make the application to the young people in here. It's healthy to question what we believe as long as we question with the right attitude. It's when we decide that, oh, since everyone's a hypocrite, and by the way, everyone's a hypocrite, let's just nail that down. Let's just get that argument out of the way. That's, that's a moot point. But here's what I believe with all my heart that second generation Christians, especially when they go to... Find out. They go to the workplace. They go to school. They go whatever it is. It's time to move out. Whatever it is, they start questioning things, and they do so in a way of I just don't believe it because everyone's a hypocrite. Yeah. And they also feel a little bit ashamed to question. That ought not be so. It, we we'll tell them it's okay to question. Ask the hard questions. Is God real? Nail it down. Answer it right now. He's real to me, obviously. I believe this book. I'm not stumbling at Christ. He's not an offense to me. Amen. He's precious to me. But I wonder why Christ doesn't seem so precious to some people. Yeah, come on. And I have a feeling it's because, number one, they're ashamed or embarrassed to ask the questions they don't want to ask. Because they think they're going to be ridiculed to death. Do we love them? And why do they, I mean, let, let's, let's just nail this down too. People's feelings are valid. Whether or not we offend someone, they might feel offended at something we said or did. Be it how we said something. My wife's always telling me, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. She told me that. She's been telling me that since we were dating I mean, it, it, well, you didn't say anything wrong. It's just how you said it. Okay? And that is something that I've always had to work on. Believe me, I come by it honest. My mom and dad are both the same way. Okay? They would admit to it too. But here's the point. If our children feel like they cannot approach us, or if children feel like you are not, feel like you are not approachable and they cannot confide in you, we're going to lose them. Plain and simple. Because we then make Christ the offense. 
because we have become an offense to them. Because all it is at that point is vain, empty religion. Sometimes I think that we care more about the lost outside the four walls than we do about the, the people in our own homes. I've been guilty of that. I have. Get so wrapped up in trying to serve God and follow God that I neglect my family. And I've learned the hard way. It's not easy. If Christ is precious to us, then the things that Christ considers precious are going to be precious to us as well. Do you know what precious means? I think we throw words around a lot too that we just don't really know what they mean. And it's okay if we don't know what it means. But here's the thing too. There's going to take a little bit of humility on all of our part to admit that we might not be as smart as we think we are. Okay? It, it's okay. But we have to be open when someone says, you know, bro, I don't know what that word means. Okay, praise the Lord. You were humble enough to say that. But I think sometimes people feel intimidated to say, I don't know what that means. Precious means it's priceless, but it's a little more than priceless. It means that it is invaluable. Christ is invaluable. There is no way that you can put a price or a value on Jesus Christ ever. He's invaluable. So we're saved by the living stone, and he thus makes us alive. You see here in verse 5 that we are a spiritual house. Christ is the chief cornerstone upon which we are built. The Holy Spirit adds to the church such as should be added. Okay, And daily, we see that in Acts. We see that throughout the whole book of Acts. In fact, each one of us is here. Okay, let me back up. Here's a prayer that Brother Potter prays all the time. And I learned a lot from Brother Potter. I love the man. I respect him. He used to pray this, and at first, when I first heard it, I thought, what? He's right. He, his prayer was this. Lord, add to this church those who should be here and keep those out who should not. I was so full of fundamental thinking that I was like, wait a minute, what? Keep people out? We can't keep people out. The church is a hospital for the lost. Yeah. That's what the fundamentalists taught me. They don't know what the church is. They don't know, they don't discern the Lord's body. You see, we discern the Lord's body. He is the chief cornerstone. He is what everything is built on. The church is built on Christ. He's the head. Okay, so the chief cornerstone, as the head, ordained by God. If that's offensive, you don't believe the Bible. Jesus Christ is now an offense. If the doctrine of Christ is offensive, Christ is now an offense, and you are walking in unbelief, which is disobedience. The doctrine of Christ is the baseline of our faith. Everything is built on Christ. Everything. He is the Word. He is the Word. Do we, not, do we understand that? God created everything by the Word. Colossians 1.13 tells us that God didn't create anything without Jesus Christ. He created everything that was made. All things. And guess what? Since we're a spiritual house, we're saved by grace through faith, not of works. We can't boast about it. And we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus personally and corporately. This is His church to work in. I am, you know, it's easy to get up and preach. The thing I agonize about is getting God's message. It's always something that, I mean, I'm like, Lord, I don't want to just get up and just say something just so I can get up and preach. Lord, I want your message for your hour, that time for whatever is needed. It's his church. He ought to be the head. He ought to be able to lead the way. He ought to be able to show us what to preach. He ought to be able to show us where to go. When we go soul winning, Lord, what street do you want us on? Who should be with who? Whose partner should be, we, you know, it's good to have a strong person and a weaker person together. And the strong person ought to say, you know what, why don't you do it? Let me help you. 
That's the way the Spirit works. He uses men to teach men, or women to teach women, or men to teach women and men. In the home, do we have a problem with the way Christ has ordained it? God, man, wife, children. That's the way God ordained it. Christ is the head of the home, too, because he's the head of the man. You know, it's like we forget, because here's what we've gotten so involved in is, is ba basically vain religion, and we're so inundated with the Catholic theology that church is just a place you go to on Sunday. So you feel better about yourself on Monday. So that you can get rid of all the things you did Saturday night, get a little bit of clean, get a little bit of God. That's what it was in my house. Let's go get a little bit of God so we can go on and go do our thing. I wasn't allowed to ask the hard questions. No one had the answers that I knew anyway. But see, Christ is an offense to the lost. That's why the law of God is there. He's a stone that they stumble at, especially to the Jew. But see, we also look here in verse 5, we, not only are we a spiritual house that is built by Christ, we're in holy priesthood. You know, it's amazing, that, that word holy, separate, there's another word holy that is not the same meaning, it just means whole. W-H-O-L-Y. You see, God wants us to be holy, holy. 100%. That means when we mess up, we confess it right away. When we sin, we don't carry it around. We get rid of it. We're in holy priesthood. You know, it, it, if we jump over to verse 9, he calls us a royal priesthood and holy nation. What? How are we royal and holy as a priesthood? Well, we're offering up spiritual sacrifices. What is the first spiritual sacrifice? Romans 12, 1. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. We're spiritual sacrifice. We're sacrificing ourselves. Die daily is what Paul did. That's what God expects. His will, not mine. And that means if it's His will, do you ever get on your face and say, God, I don't understand this? If you don't understand everything, then how can we say that, or how can we expect our children to understand everything? And then when they question, we want to ridicule them. Or get angry. But if some lost person out on the street questions, we'll help them. Christ is our mediator. Because of the priesthood, he's the high priest. He's the one we can go to. We can ask him the tough questions. We can tell him, Lord, I don't believe this right here. I want to, but I'm having a hard time buying into all of it. But our children aren't allowed to. So again, is Christ an offense to us or is he precious? Because children are precious to God. <clears throat> again, there's no middle ground with God. I love verse 6. It is the Peter here is quoting Isaiah 28, verse 16, okay? And the thing that I want to focus on, though, I can get off on the elect and all that. We're not talking about the elect. We know that there's the Calvinism is, is total hogwash. I get it. I can prove it just in verse 9. But ye are a chosen generation. That let's just make let's just find the simple subject of verse 9 so we can kick this bunny as we go by, kill it, we can skin it real quick and get on back to what we're going to. Ye are. That is the simple subject of that sentence. Ye being the noun, are being the verb. Chosen is not a verb in that, se in that sentence. Chosen is very rarely a verb in, that in anywhere you find it in the Bible, unless it's... Anyway, I, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I had to go back to the root word. The root word here means... Let me, let me find it. I got ahead of myself. <clears throat> 
It means favorite. That is the implied meaning of the root word. It means favorite. That means that since we are God's favorite, we are the favorite among people. The saints are God's favorite among people. He doesn't hear the prayers of the lost. So obviously we're his favorite. Why? Because we believe him. It's impossible to please God without faith. Ye are is the verb there. So what I want to look at, though, is, is the last two words of verse 6, the last sentence, rather, um, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. In Isaiah, Isaiah quotes it as, and he that believeth shall not make haste. Well, make haste will not be confounded means to not be ashamed or not be shamed, rather. But make haste means to do it quickly. What What's going on here? Well, I'm glad you asked. Number one, how many of us have read 1 Timothy 3? Or 2 Timothy 3, rather. Let's turn there. I want, I, I'm, I want to prove a point. I want you to see this, okay? I believe, I mean, I, I believe the Bible, and it's okay, and we do believe the Bible. We know that this is very true. But are we just to sit back and let it happen? That's the question. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, and so on. Down through verse 7. Perilous times will come in the last days. All of these things are going to happen. People are going to get away from God. Darkness is going to really take over. Are we supposed to quit being light because that's going to happen? No. Now get back to make haste. What God is saying there in Isaiah to the Jews is, you know the prophecies. These things are going to happen but don't speed them up. Keep living for God. Keep living for God. Be faithful. Peter says not be confounded because he's talking to Christians who are under severe persecution. He says just because you may think it's shameful, you're not going to be put to shame. You're a holy sacrifice. If you die for Christ... Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints. Don't, let, don't be shamed. You see, Christ said if, there were, if we're ashamed of Him, He'll be ashamed of us before His Father. But if we don't know what we believe, and He's an offense to us, isn't that being ashamed? It's kind of the same thing, isn't it? You see, complete belief is complete obedience. And complete unbelief is complete disobedience. The lost world is in complete unbelief. Some of them might say they believe in God. Some of them might say they even believe in Jesus. But ultimately, they don't care about what God says. They don't care about what His Bible says. They're not walking around saying they're saved. Some of them might tell you they're okay with God. Me and God got us an understanding, that kind of nonsense. But at the end of the day, they really don't care about what God says. But Peter here is talking to New Testament believers, those who name the name of Christ. And he says, if you walk in disobedience, you're walking in unbelief. Look at verse 7. Unto you therefore which believe, he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient. Now does he really make a distinguishment there between saved and lost? Can saved people walk in disobedience? If we're disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. It can be as simple as, I don't want to get rid of that music. I don't want to change the way I dress. I don't want to submit to you, Lord. I want to do it my way. I don't think I need to be at church. I don't want to submit to my husband. I don't want to be kind to my brother or sister. I don't want to obey my parents. 
You want to know God's simple will for each one of us? Here's, I mean, this is the secret to life right here. Secret of happiness. Men, lead your homes. Ladies, submit to your husbands. Children, obey your parents. God's simple plan right there. But if we don't do those things, we're walking in disobedience. And if we're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, God's favorite people, and we say that, we claim the name of Christ, people we know say that, oh yeah, they know we're Christians. At least they know we say we're Christians. But how do we act? God wants us to live holy, separated lives unto Him. We're, to be holy means, yes, to be separate. But to just say to be separate, that really kind of is a little broad in itself. What are we to be separate from and what are we to be separated unto? Amen. We're to be separate from the world, the former lusts. We're to kill those things. Give not occasion to the flesh. And then over here, it's be obedient to God. We're separated from this unto him it's a pretty simple life really it's not always easy though he says which in time past were not a people but are now the people of God now I want to squash this and we're done we do not replace Israel we're grafted in among them Israel is God's people the believers us as saints are grafting among them. Now we are made a people of God. There's no more sacrifice. There's no more priests. We don't have to go to a man. We don't have to confess to a man. We don't have to bring a lamb or a dove or a goat or a bull or any of that and kill it on the altar and let and sprinkle the blood. We don't have to do that. We can go straight to God because Jesus Christ is our mediator. But if he's an offense to us, we won't go straight to God. Has anyone in here ever done anything and you know you were sinning and you're like, I, I, I've gone too far now. I can't get it right right now. I, tomorrow morning I'll get it right. I guess I'm the only one that's ever done that. And in the morning you feel like dirt. Lord, I feel like Adam right now. See, when we're walking in darkness, we know it. We know it, and we know God's not pleased. And since we know God's not pleased, we have a little bit of a shame. The good thing is, though, we can hit our face, and we can say, God, forgive me. I wasn't living separate then, but I want to today. Amen. Forgive me. And guess what? He's faithful and just to do it, and He will. So let me ask you a question. Is Christ precious to you, or is He offensive? If He's offensive, figure out why, please. Now. Figure out why now. And if you can't figure out the answer, ask someone. And if someone approaches you to ask you the hard questions and you don't know the answer, say you don't know the answer. But don't give them a hard time either. Please. Let's actually love each other. We belong to the same nation, and we're priests before God. Praise God! Amen. That gets me excited. Let's pray. Father.